invite you to turn again in our uh, series. We're going to look today at John 4, and we're going to continue to think about the different styles of sharing our faith. Howie Hendricks was a uh, long-term respected professor at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. He mentored a lot of pastors you would know, uh, their names at least, uh, Chuck Swindoll, David Jeremiah, Joel Stoll, Tony Evans. And he was talking about a time when he was in seminary, a young guy in seminary, going out in, in the Texas area. He was at Dallas going to seminary at that point. And he went out to preach in some remote uh, little town in western West Texas. And he said, you've all heard of nowhere. <clears throat> this was 25 miles beyond that. The teeming crowds were gathering, all 17 of them. And it was rally Sunday when you invite your friends. So the attendance has gone up that weekend. He said, I preached my heart out with all the fervor and passion of my heart. And when I got through, this tall Texan came up and said, you were wrong. I said, well, sir, you know, I've been wrong on many occasions. Tell me, tell me the deal. And he said, in your sermon, you made a moronic statement. You said you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That ain't true, because you can always feed him salt. We're talking about how you lead people to respond to the message of Jesus Christ. And our topic today is invitational style. How do you invite people in a way that they want to respond, that they want more? Um, Jesus talked about this in one of his parables when he was talking about the invitation of the banquet and said, the master said to his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and invite them so that my house will be full. It's kind of the invitational style of sharing. And the, and the uh, characteristics of this, if we want to just put a blast of information, bullet points up there for you today, from the book by Middleburg and Hybels called Contagious Christianity, uh, of this style is that they're hospitable, they enjoy making people feel comfortable and welcome. They're persuasive. They enjoy meeting new people. They're committed to activities, causes, and groups they're involved with. And they're quick to invite people to come along and include them in the activities they're involved in. They're good at making conversation, which leads to opportunities to invite people into a relationship or place where they can find a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, some of us are really gifted at this, as we're going to see in this series. Some of these styles of sharing fit some of us better than others. Some of us are really good at the conversational style, at inviting people into another layer of conversation. Some of us need help. One of my favorite stories of a guy trying to initiate a conversation with a girl, I read in Reader's Digest years ago. It's a He's a college-age student, gets on a plane bound for Miami, and right across the aisle from him is this beautiful young woman engrossed in reading a book or whatever, and he's sitting there thinking, how can I initiate a conversation with her? And he's thinking about this, brainstorming about it, and finally leans across the aisle and says, excuse me, miss, are you also taking this flight? Well, speaking of moronic statements, I'm not sure how that worked out. John 4 is a great example of an invitational style of sharing. And so just follow along with me as I read this, in some ways, a very familiar account of Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman. Verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about six hour, that's noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? 
And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said just now is quite true. <coughs> Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. It's another conversation, as lots of gospel conversations, that teaches on several levels. It teaches about worship, certainly. It teaches from the perspective of a potential disciple who's reading the gospel as a seeker that shows us how God, through Jesus, invites everyone to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. So don't miss who he is, don't miss the point, don't miss the opportunity. But it also speaks to us as perspectives of followers who are now learning to live their faith. How did he do that? How did Jesus invite a Samaritan woman in such a way that she wants to believe? It shows in John how Jesus relates to different kinds of unbelievers said in chapter 2 that Jesus knew what was in all people, what was in them, and what they were like. And so, of course, Jesus is God, so we can't be like that. We can't read people's minds like that. And yet, it's a good example, maybe not the primary point, but a good example of how does Jesus lead a Samaritan woman to believe. And I want to suggest there are several layers of appeals or invitations that lead her along to the process of believing that he is the Messiah. And what you see, as I was reading this, is he doesn't start with a deep spiritual needs. He starts with felt needs, everyday needs, which means we should be sensitive for the felt and real needs of people who are seeking in our lives. See their felt needs and how they might lead us to a conversation about their real needs. <clears throat> At first, he appeals to her kindness. I, I need some water. Another lesson, by the way, of this story is examples in the Gospels of the kind of people that Jesus relates to. And if you've read John uh, to this point, then you know that in John 3 is the story of, of Jesus interacting with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a, a very different person than the Samaritan woman. He was educated, he's an orthodox insider, he's powerful, he's a part of the ruling class, he's respected, he has great theological training, he's a man, a Jew, a leader, she's none of that. She's Samaritan. You can study the history, it's in your study Bible notes. They are descendants of mixed race Jews, the Jewish people who were left behind in Assyria, in the Assyrian uh, exile in 721 B.C. They're left behind in the, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, and they intermarry with the other Canaanites who were in the area, and they became Samaritans, mixed-race Jews. So they are Jews, but not full-blooded Jews. And they, uh, in, they, they compromised Judaism over the centuries, some six centuries between then and now, this point. And they have set up competing locations for worship, which will come out later. But the point is, Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. In fact, 
uh, a few years after this, some 30 years after the time of Jesus, the Jewish Pharisees and the leaders upgraded their code to put in writing that uh, if you associated with a Samaritan woman, you were ceremonially unclean. They made it part of their code. So she is surprised. She's a little bit sarcastic, maybe. Sir, uh, um, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. What are you doing? It's not that he's asking for help. It's also that he would even talk to her. She's not only a Samaritan, but she's a woman. And it was completely forbidden to talk to a woman, not your wife, in public. Gary Berger, commentator, writer on uh, John, said when he was traveling in the Mideast some, a few decades ago when he was writing a commentary on this, he said, I accidentally had a conversation on a street in a Middle East town and, with a woman, and it was embarrassing to everybody. I had no idea I'd broken the, the code, and the men were alarmed, and I was embarrassed, and the, the lady that I was talking to was ashamed. It's still a code. So she's surprised because, he's, because she's a Jew, uh, because she's a Samaritan, and he's a Jew. She's surprised because he's a woman. She's a woman, he's a man, but she's also surprised because she's nobody. Not only is she nobody, she's a sinner. The reason that she's there at noon alone is because nobody else in her community wanted to be seen with her in public. And so she's figured out the best way for me to get water, it's not the most convenient time of the day, it's the worst time of the day, but it's when nobody else will be there, and they won't be ashamed to be seen with me. So he begins by a simple appeal to her kindness. I need some water. But then he appeals to her curiosity. You ever start talking to your kids and say, hey, I heard about this, uh, something coming up in your, that your teacher's planning for your class at school. Oh, oh that's right, I'm, that's, I'm not supposed to talk about that with you. And what does that do to your kids? Or kids, when you're talking to others, and say, I have a secret. And what does that do? It just makes you want to know more. And Jesus is saying here, if you knew who you were talking to and who it is that asked you for a drink, but you don't know, so you don't ask, what are you talking about? She reacts the way she does. I, you've got nothing because she doesn't know who he is. Ironically, God in the flesh, and she as a Samaritan sinful woman, has given up on God, has certainly given up on men and Jews. And she is incredulous. She is mystified. You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. You don't have a bucket, well's too deep. Now we know, we know because we're reading it, we know she's missing the whole point. She's talking about a physical well, he's talking about a spiritual well. She's comparing this location to her father, the patriarch Jacob, who built that well. She has no idea that who she's talking to is way more significant than even one of the four great patriarchs of Judaism, Jacob. She doesn't see any hint of supernatural power or believe there could be any kind of divine intervention. Jesus doesn't make fun of her or tease her. He invites her. He appeals to her desire. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. He's about to transition then from her physical need, which we all need. We all need water every day. But he's now transitioning from that felt need to the real need that we all need for eternity, living water. But she's still stuck back in the physical, not the spiritual. And maybe she should have known, although Samaritans did not read the whole Old Testament, they only read the Pentateuch, the first five books. But if they had heard anything about some of the prophets, they would have known that this living water could be a code word 
Jeremiah had said, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Isaiah had invited, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk, without money, without price, because that's what you need, living water. So her reaction is good. Verse 15, I, I have a need. He's making an offer. She says, give me this water. So I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here. See, Jesus is using a felt need to draw her to her real need. Philip Yancey tells a story about a guy who was working with homeless in the Colorado area, I'm assuming. Um, he said that homeless people, when they hit the bottom, they don't waste time building up an image or trying to conform. They pray without pretense parenthetically he said it's a refreshing contrast to what you find in churches sometimes. And he told a story about what he, he said, my friend and I were playing guitars and singing, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee, when David, a homeless man, started crying when he heard him singing. And he said, that's what I want. I want that water. I'm an alcoholic, and I want to be healed. Jesus uses a felt need to begin to lead her to a real need. So we should be sensitive to the felt and real needs of people in our neighborhoods, in our, our mission field. Dan Meyer, in a message that posted online on this passage, gave an example, he says, uh, about people that sometimes it's hard to know what's really going on in their lives. I think of the crusty surface of Mr. Barlow, a math teacher in my high school, who we all made fun of for his abrasive ways and flights of extreme anger. We always teased him. We were afraid of him. He said, we never thought about what might lie beneath the surface of that man. The darkness of pain that might be there at the bottom of his heart shaft. The truth was that Mr. Barlow had once been a wonderfully kind and affable teacher. And then he got a phone call that his wife and all his kids had been killed in a terrible car accident. And that experience began a process in which layer after layer of anger formed over his heart like a hundred feet of limestone. Jesus is using this felt need to chip away at the barriers to get at her real need. So now he appeals to her ambition. How far is she willing to pursue this? Go call your husband like using salt to get a water to drink. How far are you willing to pursue this conversation? And her reaction is a little bit mm, sullen. I don't have a husband. So now he begins to shift. And he appeals to her guilty conscience, her sense of morality. Don't forget the role of the Holy Spirit in using that felt need to lead to an awareness of guilt. We believe that the Holy Spirit, in all that he does, glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ, quoting from our doctrinal statement. He convicts the world of its guilt. He regenerates sinners. We saw last week in Jesus' last words in Acts 1 that we are called to be missionary witnesses empowered by the Holy Spirit and Jesus has said about the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. We're not Jesus, so we have to believe the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not Jesus, but we can believe on the truth that the Holy Spirit is working in the hearts of unbelievers in our conversations with them. And the only startup cost for following Jesus is to admit your sin. So that's what he's dealing with in this appeal. He's appealing to her sense of morality, her guilty conscience. He reads her mind about everything. And so her reaction is, I can see that you're a prophet. Maybe, maybe there's two kinds of reactions going on. Maybe she's starting to think, maybe he is a prophet. Who is this guy? And, and, well, let's play Stump the Prophet. 
So it might be some of that, or it might be more just like, let's change the subject. Verse 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. It's easier to talk about a theological topic than to deal with truth. Maybe you've had examples in conversations when you get to this point and poof, they want to change the subject. What about people who've never heard? All you Christians are, you're kind of uh, snobby. What about how Christianity engaged in holy wars? What about how Christians endorse slavery? Let's talk about something else other than the issue that we should be talking about. So maybe that's what she's trying. So he ties it all together in verses 21 to 24. And you got a whole bunch of lessons, another sermon here about the, na the nature and of true worship. But he's now appealing to her heart. Because there is in every one of us a God-shaped vacuum who wants to see God. And he corrects her in one level in verse 22. What you don't know because you're a Samaritan is you're outside the plan of God. You worship what you don't know. What we do know is that Jews, even if we have a lot of things wrong, we do understand this, that the Jewish tradition is right in this, that through the Jews, all nations will be blessed. Genesis 12. And then he corrects her in verse 23 on the nature of worship, because from now on, location and tradition are not what makes worship effective. Those who worship must worship in spirit. Not spirit with a capital S, but it's a reference to our hearts, our sincerity, our passion, our inner life, our authenticity. It's what the Greek lexicon calls the pure inner worship of God that has nothing to do with holy times, places, or ceremonies. And we might add the true worship that has nothing to do with equipment, instruments, or styles of songs. It has to do with the heart. And he's saying it's fine to talk about God. It's fine to clarify what terms and symbols mean. Fine to study the word and this story. But in the meantime, do you understand that you are having an encounter with the living Christ? And are you going to respond in your spirit, in your heart? She is face to face with the answer to everything in her life. And she might miss it. Must worship in spirit. And secondly, you must worship in truth. Those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. Jesus is about to tell her the truth about himself and about the way to God. And it's not about form. It's not about style. It's not about architecture. It's not about a place. But it isn't just anyone or any way. God wants genuine worship when he's present. So her dodge doesn't work. She tries to change the subject, but he just takes it right to her heart. And her reaction in verse 25 is sincere and hope. I know the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything. So he's got her. And he appeals to faith. I who speak to you am he. Will you believe? God is looking for real worshipers, and he's telling her that the truth, uh, the truth about himself and about the way to God God is to be worshipped in the place where he is now present in Jesus, who is God in the flesh, who is truth in the flesh. If you believe me, you'll be able to worship the Father. And she believes. And she tells others. Verse 28, After leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And later on we see that many people in that town believed in him because of her testimony. She practices the invitational style of sharing her faith. And it bears lots of fruit. She invites people to come and see, who is this? So Jesus has used a series of appeals to lead her to a choice. 
The invitational style of sharing uses felt and real needs to invite people into a genuine response of faith. And from an evangelism perspective, this is one of the ways that God may have gifted you to share your faith. Use real and felt needs to invite people into relationship with Jesus Christ. Myron Augsburg was a Mennonite professor, pastor. Time magazine named him one of the five most influential revival preachers in 1969. So he's old. He's like 93. But he said, when I evangelize, I'm simply trying to describe people's deepest concerns and show how Jesus addresses them. Practice inviting people or conversation, pe people to places or conversations or events where they can see Jesus. Inviting people to a place, to an event, into a conversation where they can see Jesus. We need to practice, make it a habit. If you're gifted in this kind of, of sharing, you may be good at including others in your activities. You may be hospitable. You may be very persuasive. You may enjoy meeting new people. You may be committed to a lot of activities and causes and easily able to invite people to those activities and causes. Invite people. Invite your kids and grandkids to Awana. Invite your students and their friends to youth. We were talking in our small group on Thursday night, and of the five people there, two in recent weeks have invited friends to church. Invitational style of sharing. Just invite people to come and see who Jesus is. Practice conversations. I don't remember who this was. I had this in my notes from a while ago. One of our trucker members was laid over at a truck stop on an eight-hour stoppage because he had to take a break. He had nothing to do but wait, and he ran to another trucker and his 16-year-old son and sat in with that kid, and he talked with this kid for a long time. He had a lot of time, and he could tell the Holy Spirit was working on this 16-year-old young man. And late in the conversation, he sensed God leading Tim to ask, if Satan has deceived you, how would you know? There is a good question. If Satan has deceived you, how would you know? And God used that question to open up that kid to the idea of some kind of outside revelation, which we call the Bible. And through that conversation, later in that evening, this young man trusted Christ for salvation. Simply in a conversation, inviting people into relationship with God. So we should... We, we can practice some questions. Gordon McDonald had a wonderful resource years ago on Leadership Magazine of starter questions. Pastor Jonathan Dahl, our, our former associate, he, has, he had all kinds of good questions. Uh, but think of questions, brainstorm questions. If, you, if you're talking about this this week in your small group, if you're not in our, our uh, gifts assessment training yet, uh, there's a question there about brainstorming some good questions to ask. Uh, Gordon McDonald had some like this. What's a great day at your job look like? This is somebody you're just meeting. Tell me about your family. That's always a good question. Do you have any dreams about life 10 years from now? How does God figure into the way that you live? And then he had a list of questions later on. If you're, you're deeper in the conversation, questions that lead to Jesus. Uh, here's, here's a couple. How did God seem to you when you were a child? When in your life did you ever feel God's presence? Tell me about it. Do you know much about Jesus? There's a fairly direct question. These are better than, excuse me, miss, are you also taking this flight? <laughs> One of the most influential mentors in my life is a guy by the name of Gary Mays. Many of you, if you've been here for a while, have met him. He's... Uh, one of the missionaries that we support. When he was in high school in the early 70s in Southern California, a kind of rebellious culture at the time, maybe still is, he was a church kid, but he was going through this period of rebellion like everybody else seemed to be doing at that time, and he was confronted by a youth leader, a small group youth leader from his youth ministry, the church, who said to Gary, 
I dare you, and he quoted from Psalm 34, 8, I dare you to taste and see that the Lord is good. And he knew this, Gary. Gary was not going to back down from something like that, so he said, I will try it. And he believed. Because the Lord is good. And God used that conversation to lead him to a conversion. And in his lifetime, Gary Mays has influenced hundreds, if not thousands of leaders all over North America and the world. From one person who discerned, here's the key question in this conversation. Jesus used needs, felt needs, to lead to real needs, so the Samaritan woman believes. And as we live out our faith, we can trust the Holy Spirit will do the same through us. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the living water that has been poured out on us through Jesus. I pray that we would grow in our trust and our relational wisdom, conversational insight as we watch for opportunities that the Spirit gives to arouse interest and deepen credibility to want to know more about Jesus. To be in a place or an event or a ministry where people love Jesus. And as our friends come and see, we ask that you would change your lives. You would introduce them to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the living water. We love you and we worship you and we thank you that you live in us. In Jesus' name, amen.